Welcome to Digital Marketing Intelligence, Ask the Experts, a live bi-weekly show to help you know what to do and what's new in digital marketing for 2021 and beyond. Ask questions, suggest topics, and grow faster with actionable insights and proven strategies from the world's leading experts. Hello and welcome everybody to Digital Marketing Intelligence for Startups. Uh, Ask the Experts, I'm Marissa Morgan, your show host, and I'm also the Business Development Manager at Engage. On behalf of myself and our incredible team at Engage, I want to welcome you to today's show. Today's topic is breaking down the silos between marketing, sales, and support. And our guest expert is the world's leading expert on marketing leadership, and he'll be joining us to share his insights and also share with us some actionable takeaways on that topic. Before we get started, I do want to remind you to stick around because after I introduce our guest and we have our live interactive talk, I'll also share with you what we call our Engage News of the Week. Each week, I share a tip, a trend, a piece of news that relates directly to digital marketing and specifically is really a hot topic in today's digital world. And today's News of the Week revolves around e-commerce. So don't go anywhere. I want to share that with you after our talk. And just a friendly reminder that if you have yet to check out Engage, I want to invite you to do that after today's show. Engage is a free forever suite of premium tools to help you grow and scale your business. We actually launched this incredible bi-weekly live stream show several months ago, and we've been sharing what Engage does a little bit with you every single week. And we've also really changed the topics of our show to really hit different groups of people, different uh, business sizes, whether we started, let's see, we started with uh, just digital marketing in general. Then we tried to move to a more entrepreneurial kind of look at digital marketing. And now we're talking about small businesses, startups, and all of our tools relate to all of you out there, whether you're an entrepreneur, a small to mid-sized business, Maybe you're even a larger business looking for a better opportunity to grow and scale your business and a software platform to help you optimize your customer experience. Definitely give us a look. Uh, You can check us out, N-G-A-G-G-E dot com at the end of today's show. And I also want to encourage you, if you've yet to check us out, check out Engage Live. We also have a program that we just put into play a few months ago that helps people go ahead and start their own podcasts or their own live stream show. So if that's something that you've been wanting to do to build your brand, to, you know, basically be able to engage with unlimited leads, let us know. We're happy to help you. We can produce the shows for you and provide you with a host like myself, or we can teach you how to do it yourself. And that is EngageLive.com. Check that out after the show if if that sounds like something you would want to do. Now, right now we're live on LinkedIn. We're live on Facebook. We're also live on YouTube. However, we have a podcast as well. So if you're listening to the audio on a podcast replay, I'll make sure to spell things out for you and just make sure that you can follow along, even if you aren't watching live or watching a replay live. So that's all the business. Now, without further ado, I want to introduce you to our very special guest who is joining us all the way from the UK. His name is Thomas Barta. Now, if you don't know who Thomas is, you need to. Thomas is an organizational psychologist and a former partner of McKinsey. His pioneering research brings a new perspective to executives leading change for customers. And his work, and this is very impressive, includes the world's largest study involving over 68,000 assessments on what makes for a successful change leader. Thomas is the author of the number one leadership book for marketers, The 12 Powers of a Marketing Leader. And he also writes for Forbes, Marketing Week, and his own Try This blog. And you can find that on his website, which we'll share after today's show. 
Many of his clients include prominent companies, including over two dozen that are on the Fortune 500 list. And after fast tracking his marketing career at Kimberly Clark, whom we all know from Kleenex, the Kleenex brand, Thomas became a partner of McKinsey. And as a dean of the firm's highest rated internal program, Thomas has trained over a thousand McKinsey leaders on driving change without authority. Thomas is a leadership dean of the Marketing Academy, CMO Fellowship, and an honorary fellow of the Marketing Society and I'm not done. Thomas holds an MBA from London Business School and a master's in clinical organizational psychology from INSEED Business School, which is located in France and Singapore. And he has given hundreds, if not at this point, thousands of keynotes and master classes for companies, associations, and universities, including Adobe, Cisco, Google, IBM. Oh my goodness, the list goes on and on. His resume is incredible. And today he's here to help us understand how we can break down silos between marketing, sales, and support. This is a live and interactive talk. I'm about to share the link right now on LinkedIn myself. So if you're watching right now live on LinkedIn, if you have any questions or comments, or you just want to welcome Thomas to our show, please drop those in the comment section below. And without further ado, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us as our expert on digital marketing intelligence. Marissa, thank you very much for having me and for reminding me that I'm getting old. <laughs> I don't know if you're getting older, wiser, smarter, more handsome. We'll leave that all up to uh, <laughs> our guests to decide. But tell us just a little bit. I'm going to share the link to today's talk right now, right to my LinkedIn page. So while I do that, share with the audience, I mean, I just shared your resume, but share with us what got you interested in this topic, right, of of marketing and being able to influence and change and, um, you know, the relationship with customers and a little bit about your experience, maybe with McKinsey, whatever you'd like to share to give our audience a little more understanding of how you got into that. That would be very neat. Thanks, Marissa. I appreciate it. Yeah. Look, um, I was a weird kid because I liked advertising more than I liked, did like movies. You know, when the TV went on and there was an ad, I loved it. And I was five years old and was playing it out. And I said, I want to become a marketer. And my parents said, no, you're going to do a proper job. I became a marketer because I didn't listen to my parents. And I led the Kleenex business, the household business in Europe. You, many of you know the Kleenex brand. There were some others. And at that point, as a marketing director, I was sick and tired of it because I felt, you know what? Why is finance making the decisions when we know what customers want? So I'm out. I joined McKinsey and I had this idea that I tell the CEOs how marketing works and that is important. And then I met the CEOs and I figured they already knew that. But what was interesting, you see marketers, digital marketers, you see agencies at clients, and you kind of see when you sit in a C-suite and like behind, you kind of see who's, who's getting their way. And as one of the hobbies, I, I was a dean of making this leadership program. And we're teaching people there, when I was still at the firm, we were teaching people how to have influence without authority. And I felt, you know what? That's what marketers need because they don't have influence. We're going to teach this. And that got me into this. And this is a new field, leading marketing. So that's why I did the research and the things to establish what marketers need to do. I think that's great. And I think that that's a really interesting um, point that you make because I think, and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think when we think about um, marketing or leading, we think that you have to have authority to be a leader, right? Isn't that the common denominator? You think in order to be a leader, you have to have authority. Uh, but in actuality, what you're saying is that's not really what it's about at all. And, and I'm guessing you would know this because you did the leading study on this that involved so many assessments and examples and, and, and such. So, I mean, it seems like the opposite would be true. That's right. I mean, and we do talk about formal authority, right? Just like I can call the shots and you don't. I mean, think about it, right? Think about think about engage, right? You work there, right? You work with them. Just imagine you wanted to change that customer experience, right? Now, how many people right, at engage would have to be involved to make that change happen, right? From your show to the actual product, to the interface, to the website, many. 
I mean, how many of them work in marketing and or to report to you or to your boss? And, and sometimes it's very few. And that power gap is something that a lot of marketers are struggling with. And we have to realize that's the reality. So no, you won't be in charge ever. If you're an entrepreneur, you have a great product and you want to bring to marketers and you hope that they'll take it and just make decisions, maybe they can't, but, or maybe they don't know how to do it. So th this power gap is important. We just have to accept it, get over it and say, okay, what else could we do? And this is where the leading comes in. You gotta, you gotta learn to influence people before you have formal authority and you can. I like that. And I think one thing, and we're, I'm going to put up a slide for those of you watching live uh, to understand a little flow of our talk today. But I think one thing that I'm learning too, it doesn't matter what company you're in and it doesn't matter how big it is or how small it is. People have to be willing to work with other departments, right? And I think that's like a very important uh, key part you can't just expect the marketing people, and we'll talk about a little bit about this, but you can't just expect the marketing people to do all the things related to marketing and not ever communicate with other departments. Um, so I think people have to be open and willing to know that, th that the team always wins, right? That's right. And when you learn marketing, be it digital marketing, be it classic marketing, be it whatever, the, be it optimization, be it CRM systems, whatever you do, we're teaching you how the technology works. We're teaching you how the tools work. We're teaching you how to do a price, how to kind of position a brand. What we're not teaching you is that then you arrive at this firm and you want to do it and they say, no, we're not interested. And you say, well, why? Because it's so important. Yeah, because, yeah, it's important for you. But if you work in engineering or in customer service, maybe people don't care at all about your idea. And for many people, it's a big shock because they were told at university, that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have to get used to, accept it, but then say, you know, okay, what could I do if I have a great CRM system and I really want to implement it, what would it take? Why would it be useful for the other people and how could I bring them on board? And learning that is something we really don't teach people, but that's where the power comes in. Ooh, you said one of our favorite words at Engage, CRM. Okay, we'll get into that. Let's go ahead. For those of you watching on LinkedIn or, of course, watching a replay of our live interactive show, I want to share with you a quick outline of some of the bullet points and talking points that we'll get to today with our very special guest, Thomas Barta. So we're talking about breaking down silos. And Thomas will explain what a silo is for those of you who may be new to that term and actualizing customer focus through leadership. So we'll talk a little bit about gaps or silos and how they obstruct growth. We'll talk about the C-suite solution, getting C-suite cooperation by creating value. The technology solution, my favorite word, CRM, adopting CRMs to provide accountability across departments, bite-sizing the issues. And that's Thomas's phrase. I really like that. How to make projects digestible. And then hitting the head and the heart, becoming a dealer in the hope. So Thomas, let's start first by talking about this idea of how gaps and silos obstruct growth. And the word silo was actually a new terminology, you know, a new term for me. My background is marketing, certainly, but digital marketing, I'm learning more and more every day in my new role at Engage. So I said to my co-producer, what is a silo? I just picture one of those things on a barn, right? And he explained what it meant to me, but I'd love for you to explain to the audience what your what your description is of a silo. Look, people in firms identify with their department. That happens a lot, right? If you work in customer service, that's the team. If you work in sales, that's the team. They have a team event in sales. And, you know, because of that, we have basically invisible barriers go up in firms and we call them silos. It's basically, you know, marketers are the same. You know, if you work in marketing department, sometimes marketers like to stay among themselves and that is a silo. And we call it silo because there's something inside, right? That's probably very valuable, but it is, doesn't really communicate with the rest. And I already talked about that power gap, remember earlier, it's one of the big gaps. And the, the, the gap is that if you have an idea and if you think it's great and you walk into that silo next door and tell them, look, you know, here's what we're going to do differently. Here's going to how we spend the money. And here is a way we change 
how we interact. Maybe some of the people in that other silo will simply hope you will get sucked into a big black hole because they don't care. It's not their agenda. Their silo has the only agenda. And that side, you know it, right? Do you, you remember? Do you know what a dongle dangler is? Have you heard a dongle dangler? Yeah, wait a minute. A dongle. Is that one of those things you put when you're can when you're like hiking? <laughs> no, oh. So the thing is this, remember, I don't know if you've seen the story, but there was a there was a moment that when when Apple had changed the uh, the um the plugs on the sockets on the on the Mac, right? Everything went to to USB C. And then the iPhone still had the old one, the USB 2, right? Mm -hmm. So you couldn't connect the, an iPhone with a, with a Mac. And if you bought them at the same time, you couldn't. So people were actually starting to buy these dongles, right? To, you know, to, to, and then what, some, someone had the idea to say, I'm going to create a dongle dangler, which is a tool where you can attach all your dongles um, so you won't lose them. And, because, and, and the dongle dangler is a great example for what happens when you have silos. Because people don't talk to each other and the customers have to figure it out. Right. And the world is full of dongle danglers, right? Where you <laughs> can try to figure. And, and, and it's not the only as Apple is a good example. So that is what happens when silos are there. Unfortunately, there's more gaps if you want to do marketing. Because I think that's something that everybody here who listens to this will have experience is a trust gap. Think about how much of the work that everybody does here is about the future, right? If you have a startup, if you have a small firm, a mid-sized firm, you, you create a lot of future things, future ideas, future this, future. And the marketers, maybe if they're buying your things, they, are, they create future revenue, future. You can't prove this, right? So, and then when you stand next to someone from the finance department who has the old numbers, right? Everything you say will sound less reliable because it is. And a lot of people don't accept that there's a trust gap. And, and many startups in particular or smaller firms are struggling with this because you don't have the proof of the finance department and people don't trust you. And it's important to realize that and not be annoyed, mm -hmm. but rather say, that's probably all right. Mm -hmm. And there's one more gap. That's a skills gap. I mean, we're talking, I mean, you, you, you have a technology firm. Uh, lots of people who are here may work at technology firm, work with technologies. It's amazing, right? What you get, technology is cool. I love, I mean, I love gadgets. I love technology. But you know what? Lots of people in marketing departments or in other, they're freaking out because they don't understand it. Because you know your product really well. And for them, it's just one of a gazillion that they could look at. And they really think, oh my God, I have no overview. And there's a lot of fear because of that. So if you are uh, selling something or if you are uh, trying to build something that you want other people to buy, you got to realize they won't tell you, but maybe they're actually afraid of the cool thing you're bringing. They won't trust you because you can't really prove it until they've done it. And yeah, maybe the person you talk to may not even have the power to decide. So with this in mind, how would you now approach a customer? And how would you maybe make your product a little bit more easy to understand? How would you build that trust and say, okay, I get it. You know, you don't trust us. Let's do this. Or how would you help maybe other people that you will sell to make the case because they're not in charge? This is when we start to remove barriers for growth. And that's the art. If you don't, you had a trust gap, you had a power gap, you have a fear gap because of skills and growth could stall. That's why growth leaders are knowing how to bridge those gaps. So let me ask you this. And I feel like this is a whole nother show, but when we talk about trust gap, power gap, skill gap, do you feel like the answer to one of those could potentially be the answer to all of them or, you know, a way to fix it or work on bridging it? Or do you think each of those gap types really has their own sets of solutions and their own? Because one of the things, um, I don't know, like when I think of a skill gap, right? I think of maybe the CRM would be an excellent, an excellent solution, right? Where you have the ability for, you know, team messaging, you have the ability for, um, agents to take calls live and be able to source the calls to different departments, right? And everybody can see everything in the CRM. Like I think of a skill gap 
um, mm -hmm. maybe having the CRM be a solution, but something like the trust gap, I feel like that, that I don't know exactly where, you know, what the solution to that would be other than, you know, working on your marketing, figuring out your customer need and working on your no like, and trust. So all these different gaps, it seems like there, am I right? Would there be different solutions for each one? So the first solution is to realize they exist. And the moment you do, um, you start to think differently about your approach. And not because you do CRM. I, I pick CRM for a different reason now, because I'll tell you why. I was, when I was at McKinsey, I, I once led what was called a customer experience practice. That's basically the whole experience. And of course, CRM is part of this. And one of my colleagues who works with finance people said, you're so stupid. I said, why? I said, who do you want to talk to? I said, what do you mean? You know, he said, would you, would you want to change experience? I mean, you got to talk. The only person you can talk to is the CEO. And, and then they may not have the power because, and, and CRM is a great example. It goes, as you said it, it goes, it touches so many departments, mm -hmm. right? The call centers and, and they all got to come on board. And who is in charge of that? Several people. It's not mm -hmm. only one person. Mm -hmm. And that shows it, right? So, for example, if I know that, I will approach a customer in a very different way. Did I not know it? I maybe take my system and say hey you buy this great software isn't it amazing and the, and the customer says that's really nice but you could also say look this is a great thing but i know it's going to be really hard for you to get everybody on board so here is how we could do it here's how we can help and maybe people won't trust you so let's here are some example how you can make the case and by the way maybe you're freaking out because you don't understand what we're selling we'll give you a, a nice tour and we really make it easy it's that. So I think it's different approaches, but the, sim the thinking is the same. You've got to accept that you're touching so many points of people who may not care. It's interesting. Very interesting. So talking about the C-suite then and mm -hmm. getting the C-suite to cooperate by creating value. You know what's funny? I used to work for a company. Mm, the C-suite was so untouchable at that company. Um, it was very difficult to, especially even being, um, on a sales marketing position when you would see things that instantly were red flags, like, oh, this is not working or the customer's reacting this way because as a salesperson or a marketing person, you're getting that interaction. There were so many times I wanted to like go directly to the C-suite and be like, you guys, this plan is not working. It's backfiring. And, and they don't see what we see. Um, how do you influence the C-suite? Obviously, you said by creating value, but what if your C-suite is super untouchable? <laughs> First off, um, what I would recommend everybody to do who works in the field of marketing or who sells anything to anybody, seriously, is to start by thinking, how would I explain this to the CEO? Mm -hmm. Even if you don't. But how would I explain it to the CEO? If you come to CEO, and there's a great marketing examples of a friend of mine who, sh who had a presentation at the boardroom, CEO was there, and he said, well, the number one priority is, this was some years back, is, is to review our segmentation and to add millennial, millennial dimension. He said, we need to increase programmatic, uh, improve programmatic across all the platforms. Third, he had a brand engagement program. And the CEO, I had a chance to talk to CEO of that meeting and he said, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Like, what? What is this brand? And, and like millennials and what, what, is he, what is this guy doing? Right? And he fired him. In fact, the CEO, he fired him. One of the, the challenges that you have, and, and you think about it as a marketer, is you have to realize how CEOs or CFOs, what, what they think about. And if you're running a company, you're very interested in revenue. You want to generate that. And when it comes, you're very interested in cost, you know, how much cost things and how much. And then there's, there's, of course, strategy and organization. And if you as a supplier, if you're some, someone who has a product, isn't positioning itself very clearly in that revenue camp, you become a cost. Mm. And a much harder sell. Nobody's going to say, sure, let's spend five minutes on a, on a system because I'm sure we'll be good. People say, no, well, wait a minute, why? 
So one of the things I, I always recommend people is help your clients and also yourself speak language that the CEO would get. I'll give you another example. I worked as a branding consultant. Now, this is when you think about brand positioning and then you got to spend money on, I don't know, making a brand, you name it, more useful, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, if you tell CEO, we need to make our brand more useful and it's real, and they're like, yeah, they might just ignore you because why? why? My story was different. We said, look, here is the market. 85% of people know you. Only 20% of people buy you. So you're losing a lot of people that don't buy you. Now, mm -hmm. we look at this and we said, there's a big driver here. They think you're old. If we change that old to young by, I don't know, 5%, we're going to make 50 million more per month. Hmm. That's black and white. He knew that. He got. heard, he he saw, he, he, he heard the problem, but then he heard the solution. And then he heard how that translated into dollars. And seriously, that's what people care about. Oh, yes. it's, it's, it's not rocket science, but think about it, right? If you talk about a brand issue in that way or a technology issue in that way, people will hear you out. You become relatable. Mm -hmm. You don't talk, you don't say segmentation to your customers. They don't get that. I mean, they, you, so same thing, right? So secrecy relevance starts with starting to think like a CEO and ask yourself if, if this was my firm, what I think, and then think about how they talk and how could you talk in the same way. Uh, I think it's going to make a light, light different, light, light speed difference um, to your success. I think even as an employee, that's a really great takeaway because if you are in a company where you have the chance to have that interaction with a weekly meeting or a monthly meeting or a Zoom with the CEO and you are asked for <sighs> feedback or you're asked for ideas or you want to respond to something, I think it's very important to take that nugget from you, Thomas, and remember to think and speak like a CEO. Um I think sometimes people get a little emotional sometimes in meetings, right? Especially if they don't agree with something. And I think you might be shooting yourself in the foot if you don't almost say to yourself, okay, I'm going to respond, but I'm going to think like a CEO because certainly a CEO doesn't want to be told necessarily that they're wrong or that their idea was not right. Um, but again, we all know that. Public. What's that? Not in public. Not in public, really not. Nobody wants public. to work with a smart ass. You can do in CEOs, you could tell they're wrong in one on ones, but not in public. True, true. It was all very good. <laughs> but you know what? You just yeah. said earlier, oh, yeah, you can't touch the sweet sweet. And sometimes you don't need to wait for that big meeting. Just imagine we have that one minute in the elevator, the moment we can do elevators again together, right? It's, it's going to come. Right. The minute we're, yeah, in elevators again. You don't need more than a minute if you have a really good idea as a junior employee when you stand next to one of the senior guys in an elevator because you're bored anyway, rather than talking about chit chat and saying, right. by the way, this one idea, uh, what do you think about that? And you say, for example, I just realized 50% of our customers are annoyed because we're doing something. I think there is an idea to change that. And just imagine that would bring X percent of more customers. Is that something that would be interesting for you? But you got to have it ready. Yeah. Right. It's almost like having your elevator people. pitch, as they say. That's where that term came from. Those people. Great, 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 great. Well, let's talk then a little bit about the technology solution, which is our next kind of topic on our outline, is the fact that CRMs, uh, provide accountability across departments. They do give different departments the opportunity to communicate, to work together, um, to all be able to have access to information. You know, I talked about this with um, the CEO of our company, Engage, how back in the day, let's just say you were a salesperson, you had your leads on your own spreadsheet, right? Maybe that spreadsheet was on your computer. Your other fellow... Um, you know, salesmen or saleswomen, salespeople had their leads on their own spreadsheets. There was really this idea that these are my customers. These are my leads, right? Well, what happens when someone gets let go? Or what happens when a customer comes in with an issue, but that salesperson's not there that day? You know, we just talked about how important it is in today's world, not only for the customer experience, but also just to solidify your company's ethics and, and morale and 
team efforts, you know, it is really important, I think, for information to be available across the board um, to everybody in all departments. Would you agree? I think uh, you will find almost nobody who knows the industry who would disagree because, of course, it's important. And and I think in, in addition to what you just said, there is something else that, that this could do. Um, I just spoke with the chief marketing officer uh, of Cisco in Asia. He also leads Global Insights uh, as Mark Phipps. And Mark Phipps has, in a, in a, in a, in a stellar way, started to use data to make marketing and make it make the function, the insights function, a true powerhouse in this firm. Before it was like, yeah, says is doing something, Margaret is doing something. Now, um, because of what he did, because he consolidated the data, I mean, things you talked about, everybody's now starting to listen to him because he, he, they have, this team now has data and has insights that everybody wants to see. Why are chief finance officers powerful? Think about it, right? In most firms, the finance people are really powerful. They're not selling anything. They're not making anything. They're not creating any customer experience. They're literally cost. You know why they're powerful? Because they know what's going on. They can tell you whether the factories are doing good. They will tell you whether, if you get a quarter. The marketing and sales function, by organizing themselves or by getting customer insights and getting the data ready and talking about it and how it relates to revenue, they will become a much, a much stronger powerhouse. And you know why that is important? Because those are the people who know what customers want. So if customers want to get a better deal, that's what marketers need to do. It's pretty obvious. Have I mentioned that you're having a great hair day today, by the way? Absolutely. And you so I have a new shampoo. <laughs> what did you say? You only shampoo? I have a new shampoo. Oh, you have a new shampoo? <laughs> so <good>. do I. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So much fun. Um, okay. So let's see. Do you want to talk about this idea, too, of bite-sizing the issues? What do you mean by that? Um, bite-sizing the issues to make them more digestible. I don't know if it happened to you. Everybody has used Excel, I guess, at one point, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I don't know whether that ever happened to you that someone creates an Excel sheet and then you add, you know, they add like column A and column B and multiply by C and then put something in D5 and add it all up. Simple spreadsheet, right? Yeah. And then they send it to you. And you're like, what is it, right? Well, how have you done this? And like, and then, yeah, it's, it's very simple. Just use it. I said, no, but it was a... So something that's very simple for you because you've created it can look catastrophically complicated for uh -huh. somebody else. It's like a big burger, right? You, you sometimes you could get some big, some people, some restaurants had this crazy that they're serving it and you can't almost eat it. And when that happens in many organizations, people will start to run. And when people, you know, just run around and come like, oh, we're going to do this big transformation. And everybody's saying, yeah, sure. And they get nervous because I mean, for you, right? I mean, take CRM, take whatever system, take any analytic system, take, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to do agile working, name, you name it. You know, it sounds really cool. People don't really want to say, ah, it's bad because they want to look uncool, but at, internally are frightened. And that, that's, that's wrong. So when you are starting specific, specific technology projects, you got to realize that a lot of people will not tell you that they're freaking out because they don't get it. The inset will just smile and then it will hide. So when that happens, your project will fail. So what you got to realize is, okay, I got to come in and say, okay, here is this thing. And by the way, don't talk about transformation and like radical digits. People like, I mean, seriously, you're frightening me. Say, look, you know, here's this thing that we want to do. And here's how this, what this does. And by the way, let me show you one of the, one of the two or three things that we're going to do next. And here is how we can help you try this out so you will actually like it. And, and you just create so much more goodwill and interest in people that otherwise you won't get. Most transformation projects fail because people are afraid to say, I'm afraid. That's why you got to bite-size the issue, take people by the hand and you know, realize that what you know may not be what they know. Those are really good points. And I want to speak to something that actually happened to us recently at our company, Engage, um, that isn't 
excellent example of that. We have learned that, and I know you'll agree, when you're so close to a project or a product or maybe a marketing campaign, a brand, whatever it may be, when you work so closely to build something, to create something like that spreadsheet you shared, most often as creators of that, we're blind to issues because we're in it. We're living it. We're so close to it that we never take that step back and look at it from a customer perspective because we can't, right? We had that at Engage where we had a particular, let's just say, um, you know, a flow of our platform, right? That had been worked out and was up and running and, and somebody from the company came in, I won't say who, and said, whoa, what if we did this and, and, and changed it this way and, you know, took this, you know, kind of just set up and kind of changed it this format or whatever. And, and my boss said, oh my goodness, Marissa, you're absolutely right. I never have thought of it that way because I'm in it all the time. And I was fresh, new eyes to the company. In essence, I was like a new customer coming in using the platform for the first time. So what was so great is we made those changes and now it's, just in my opinion, and I think the company agrees, our platform is a little more smoothly in the way that it's formatted and for user experience. Um, but I think that that's just a really good point. You have to not only be willing to break things down, right? But you have to be willing to accept and be open to feedback, I think, from your customer. And also, I think it's really important, especially if you're in technology, like you said, Thomas, you have to be willing to walk people through it you know, offer a free demo or, you know, have some really good um, kind of ex exploratory videos, right? That can walk people through um, how to use or how to do or how to create using your product or your software. These are all good things. People don't want to be afraid. And when you feel afraid, it makes you doubt yourself, doesn't it? It makes you feel like, what am I missing that I don't get this instead of realizing, hey, a lot of people don't get it. It's not you, right? It's the platform or it's the product or it's the brand. So I think these are all really good points. You got to make your customers feel empowered and not scared and your employees as well, empowered, not scared. Because they can vote with their feet, honestly. I mean, if they're afraid, they're hiding. If they're really afraid, they're fighting it. Absolutely. And they want you to fail. So get in early. And by the way, if you don't believe that people don't understand you, just ask your partner what your job is. It's going to be very interesting. Say that one more time. Well, simply ask your partner to explain what you're doing in your job to someone. And you'll be amazed how even someone who knows you really well maybe doesn't really know what you're doing. So, you know, even close people, they sometimes don't get. So, yes, you got to bite size. Bite size. I like that. And I like that. And almost like check yourself, right? Because we're all doing a lot. And, and maybe sometimes uh, we get a little lost, I think, too. In um, You can just get lost in all the busy work or all the junk or all the titles or all the confusion or all the changes, especially like you said, if you're in a company that's working towards a big transformation, break it down, bite size, simplify, empower people, whether they're your employees or your customers, don't scare them. I feel like you can never, I'm curious if you agree, I feel like you can never oversimplify. And I know we started our show and I said, Thomas, can you explain what a silo is? You know, because I, you know, we're live on LinkedIn right now. Someone could be tuning in who doesn't have a lot of marketing experience. Maybe they've never heard that term. I feel like you can never start too simple because you can always grow from there. But it is hard when you jump into something, whether it's a concept, a marketing plan, an idea, whatever. Um, if you start too complicated, people's ears turn off. And they become disengaged because they are scared. They're like, I don't even know what the first sentence out of this guy's mouth is. I'm not listening to this talk, right? They won't tell you. Yes, they will. Or they won't. <laughs> All right. Well, let's wrap up our talk with this last point that we shared on our outline, which is the idea of hitting the head and the heart, um, becoming a dealer in hope. Let's talk about how important, you know, emotion is along with obviously the intellectual side of things. What is your stance and your thoughts on that? What would you like to share? 
Um, many of you know Jim Farley, who's a um, former chief marketing officer of Ford, is now the CEO, one of those great role models that we have in marketing, someone who takes the entire company. And when Jim Farley joined Ford um, from Toyota, he joined when Ford was literally bankrupt. Some of, some of you may remember that time. It's not that long ago. I had a really bad time. And, and Jim came in as a marketer and he could have just come in and said, hey, you know, I need this budget and we do new segmentation and we're going to do this and that. And he did, of course, he did all of that, but he did something else. He said, look, guys, the reason my parents bought a car was that the, Ford, the blue Ford Oval was a symbol of pride for them. Mm. And look at it now. Look at the Wall Street Journal and you know, they're writing about bankruptcy. That is not pride. So we got to, the reason we got to advertise and do marketing is we got to bring that pride back. And then he had some charts to show how marketing and advertising works. And he fought that out and he did all of that too. So he appealed to the head and the heart. And, and that is important because if you, no matter, I mean, look, you, this is true for marketers, but also true for everybody who is who is marketing a small product. I mean, every, look, what's a marketer? By just to make that clear, right? A marketer to me is everybody who is marketing something—a product, a service, or an idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, the activists that want to change the world and and stop global warming—they're marketers because they're trying to get an idea across and get people to change. So that's what I'm what I'm talking about. So as a marketer. You gotta, you gotta, you can't prove anything. You you can't get people to do anything, but you can tell them a story, and you can you can tell them a story that captures their hearts and their minds. People are very cynical. If you tell them a bullshit story, they'll see through and they'll hate you. But if you have something to say that's important, realize that there are some people who want the facts, but there are some people who want hope too, and that's a big group. So how can you do this? How can you like for like like Jim Farley on on Ford side talk about the pride of the oval but how it relates to revenue um at at smith former chief chief marketing officer of one of the largest uh, global papers in, in sort of paywall and that was tough and the journalists were going crazy uh, that was a that was he was in one of the innovators of the paywall so now everybody's a paywall and you know he didn't say we need a paywall he said look i'm here to help save quality journalism that was a story. He still had his business plan and all the things. And as change leaders, as digital leaders, as startups, you all dealers in hope. You, you, you're giving something to people that makes the world better. Talk about it in a way. Talk about it in a way that people appeal to it emotionally. And then, of course, you got to give people the facts because some people want to see those. And that will make a powerful pitch for the product you're selling, the work you're doing, the idea you have. I agree with that mantra, especially for me coming from, I want to say like the employee standpoint again too, because I've worked with leaders who have had that um, kind of multifaceted approach in their leadership where they were very emotionally connected with their employees, but also you know, did all the technical stuff right and made sure that we were all doing our jobs. And, you know, I don't know, had all the, had everything, you know, technically they, they should to be a good leader, but they were emotionally invested in their employees. And those leaders made the best believers in us as employees. And then of course we are ambassadors, right. For the company. So and, and the good that news is, and, and, and I think to your point, right, the good news is people can learn that. It's mm -hmm. not something that some people have or don't have. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we, right now, um, one of the things I am doing as one of the core, core work is we have a leadership class for marketers. That's a, called Marketing Leadership Masterclass, unsurprisingly. But we're teaching people what we just talked about. And one of the big things what we're seeing and we just have a course live right now and this we have that debate is again that everything you just talked about like the emotional connection we and then people say you know what i tried this i now went out for the first time and rather than just show my project i told why we're doing this why this is a story and i had a few facts and i just had that meeting and people came to me and said i finally get you and i think what this tells us is 
I mean, this is not just what we're doing in the marketing leadership masterclasses, what other people can do too. It tells you that you can learn these things. You can learn them. It's it's not about getting old and you, you finally have the idea. You can learn them very early on and learn to build that influence as a mm-hmm. entrepreneur, but also as someone who works in a firm. Agree. Well, let's talk a little bit, Thomas, as I share with our audience how they can connect with you. Let's talk a little bit about that masterclass. I do want to share with our viewers, again, whether you're watching live right now on LinkedIn or you're watching a replay of this show or listening to this as a podcast, Thomas is open to connecting and and you can connect with Thomas on LinkedIn and you can find him T Barta. So T as in Tom, B-A-R-T-A. So LinkedIn.com forward slash I-N forward slash T Barta is how you can find him. And then also Thomas's website is just filled, like chock full of information about his book. His blog is there, Thomas Barta, T-H-O-M-A-S-B-A-R-T-A.com is where you can find out more about Thomas. Is there information? I want to say there is, but I don't have it pulled up right now. There is information about your masterclass on your website, isn't there or no? Um, so there is, uh, uh, so and two things. Um, first off, this masterclass is relevant if you want to build influence as a marketer, as a digital leader, as someone who is an expert in the field, but maybe don't have enough people listening to what you're doing. So that's what we're teaching. It's not expensive. In fact, it's a cheap class compared to other things you can do. And it's the only class. So in, in that sense, we have a quite a, more, a special position, but it, it's a lot of fun. And in fact, it's not a, the way we're teaching is, I mean, it's, you, you, there's a lot of things where you get 10 videos and then watch them at your own time. That's it. We're actually having a debate. And in, in fact, the way this works, just imagine you, you would, you would, it's not on Facebook, but you would um, uh, join a closed Facebook group and we're feeding ideas in it and there's real lectures, but the whole debate goes on. So you can connect with other people in your field who have the same problem and ask you problem solve together. That's kind of what we're kind of convening and we're teaching. Um, it's on that page. And I should say this, if you do thomasbarter.com slash and you put behind that slash only fans, that's when you get to the secret page that actually has the has more information on the class and a lot of readings. Oh, you did that now. I always wanted to have an OnlyFans page, and that was my only way to do it. (laughs) I love it. So (laughs) check it out, thomasbarta.com forward slash. That's a forward slash, right? Someone told me that that that's a backslash, but that's forward. Yeah, whatever that thing is, right, that you do after the dot com, you're right. It's like it's falling on the rest of the words. (laughs) OnlyFans is where you can find out more about that master class and all the goodies that Thomas can help you with in terms of understanding marketing, understanding how to be a better leader. And I'll tell you, your resume is quite impressive, Thomas. I obviously connected with you a few weeks ago when you agreed to come and join us for a show. And when I really dove into all of the wonderful things and experience that you have and that you've done, it's it's really, really impressive. Where can our audience find your book right now? Um, the 12... I want to say it's powers the 12 of Powers of Marketing. Yeah. Yeah, this is when you have big publishers and they give you a very long book, book title. So this is this McGraw-Hill, one of the large publishers. So the book title is long. It's the 12 Powers of a Marketing Leader. Of course, it's on Amazon.com everywhere. Amazon, perfect. Yeah. yeah Great. So well, check it. out his book on Amazon as well. And do connect with Thomas on LinkedIn. Thomas, your show is going to be replayed on our LinkedIn page and it will go live in our show library in just a few days. For those of you who are new to our show, we do a, usually two shows a week. This week we only have one, but usually we do two shows each week. And after the show is done, it will be available for replay um, in our podcast library as a podcast um, and also in our live show library. And it is going to be at engage.com forward slash live dash show dash library. That's where Thomas's show will live with other amazing, very, very successful, powerful, and influential guests um, that we've been so lucky to have on our show. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us more insight on different ways to not only break down silos, but really to... Um, really to, as you said, be a better leader um, and connect with people within your, um, I want to say just within your organization on a, in a way that is um, influential um, without needing, what was it? Without needing 
the formal authority. You don't formal need to, you don't need a job title and the badges for it. You can do it in another way. That's very cool. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you joining us as a guest on the show. I'm going to share our Engage news of the week. And again, just thank you so much. Please connect with Thomas and leave him a message to let him know that you heard and saw him on Engage's Digital Marketing Intelligence for Startups Ask the Experts. Thanks again, Thomas. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for having me. Wow, an amazing guest again here at Engage Digital Marketing Intelligence. Thank you so much for joining us. And please do connect with our guests. They want to come on the show because they want to offer their insights and their actionable takeaways in digital marketing. And as we, as Thomas shared, he also has a great masterclass that would be very, very helpful, especially if you're someone who has ideas and you want to get out there, but you just don't have the people listening, right? And I like the idea that Thomas also offers this cool forum in his masterclass so you can connect with like-minded people in the same industry and work on problem solving together. That's pretty great. Um, real quick before I end today's show, of course, I want to share with you our Engage Digital Marketing News of the Week. At the, at the beginning of our show, I let you know that today's marketing news of the week uh, had to do with e-commerce, and it does. It has to do with TikTok. On September 28th, TikTok held its first ever TikTok World Business Showcase event, where it shared a range of new tools and options designed to help brands make the most of its platform, while also painting a clearer picture on how TikTok plans to monetize its now billion-plus audience and help creators earn money for their efforts. TikTok clearly states that e-commerce will be their main focus, especially into 2022, and shared a lot of tools and solutions for brands. And here are just a few of those tools and solutions that we thought you might be interested in. So they're going to, TikTok is going to start offering new product links in video clips, new collection ads to include product cards, dynamic showcase ads, customized instant pages, new stickers to illustrate products in clips, gesture ads to actually reward users who engage. This is incredible. And story selection ads to prompt more interaction in clips. If you want more information on all these massive updates, I'm going to go ahead and throw the link up for you. You can check out socialmediatoday.com. As always, it's been a pleasure to host our weekly show with you on behalf of Engage. If you have any ideas for future shows, or maybe you know somebody who might be a future guest and would love to come on and share their time with us, their insights and their actionable takeaways in a topic on digital marketing, check me out. I'm on LinkedIn as well, the Marissa Morgan, and you can email me at marissa.m at engage.com. That's how you can stay connected with me. Also be sure to connect with Engage, our company page. We're working on really building a following on our company page, and we all know that can be a little difficult to do, especially on LinkedIn. So give us, give us a hand. Go to our Engage company page, look for the rainbow colored cog, give us a follow, and that's where you can find information on future shows, future guests. You can find show replays there, and of course you can find more information about our platform as well. On behalf of myself and the entire team at Engage, I want to thank you again for joining me for another amazing episode this week with Thomas Barta. Join me next Tuesday. Our guest is going to be Gustavo Escobar. He's a leading LinkedIn marketing expert, and he'll be joining us Tuesday, October 26th at 4 p.m. Eastern and sharing his proven strategies to double your sales using LinkedIn. Join me then. And until then, I hope you all have a blessed and wonderful day. See you guys all next time.